Hey everybody, Justin Cener here. I want you to take a look at this video. This is actually clipped together from my live event last year. I did a $500 conference, private uh, conference last year. This is one of the sessions from it, and I want to make sure you see this. I'm talking about six misconceptions that can completely kill your Shopify business. Six basically myths that you know a lot of people get wrong. So make sure you check out this business. Make sure that you smash through any of these misconceptions before you get into this incredible business. It's a misconception that you need 10 to 20 amazing products to succeed. I kind of already touched on this, right, as the example. You don't need that at all, right? 10 to 20 products, if you had 10 to 20 amazing products, right? You give me 10 products right now that you're scaling, they're working, and you let me go ahead and scale them for you, you make a million dollars in a month. I, I, I'm very confident about that. 10 to 20 products is a ridiculous amount, right? 10 to 20 amazing products, that's ridiculous. You all heard of the 80-20 rule, right? 80% comes from 20%. I'm talking about the 95-5 rule for e-commerce. We're talking about 95% of your revenue is gonna come from 5% of your products, okay? So what does that mean for you? You don't need to stress out saying, I need to find 20 amazing products this week. All you need to find is one product. You find one product, it's gonna carry you for weeks, if, weeks if not months, in your store, right? And let me, let me kind of play devil's advocate. Why wouldn't this work, right? Well, is, this won't work if you don't know how to scale. Right? Why does this work if you do know how to scale? You find a winning product, right? You know that people want it, now it's, you go ahead and go all in. Right? Okay, great, I know that something works here, I'm gonna spend money. If you don't wanna spend money, if you don't wanna scale, right, then you're never gonna be able to hit uh, a big numbers or you're gonna need to find multiple products which is just not realistic. Right? So scaling is totally required to make this business realistic for you unless you're some kind of Houdini with launching 100% winning products. Right? And for most people that's not gonna happen. Okay. Hardest part of the business, no doubt, is basically finding good products and matching them up with the customer. This is otherwise known as marketing, right? Matching up your product with the right customer. Once you do that, right, I call, it, I call scaling your reward, right? Once you find this match, it's time to get rewarded in terms of making money, right? So when you find this match, when you're going to do this hardest part, right, then it's time for you to actually kind of reap the reward. So never be scared of scaling. Scaling plays into this 95-5 rule. Okay? It's just simply not realistic to expect you know, even a 50 or a 25% success rate on your product launches. Okay? Now, you could find one winning product. Let's say you do one out of 20. Right? One out of 20 uh, uh, launches, you find one winning product. Okay? I call this the volume game strategy. The idea is you're gonna keep launching. You're gonna play the volume game. You're gonna play the numbers. You're gonna launch product after product. You launch 10 products this week, great. Next week, you're gonna launch another 10. Okay, the week after that, launch 15. Okay, I want you to launch product after product after product. Why? Because we saw over here, you don't need to find 20 winning products, you need to find one. How do you find more winning products? Well, you launch more products overall, right? If you're hitting at a 5% or a 10% product hit rate, well, 10% of 100 is 10, 10% of 1,000 is 100, right? The number will stay the same in terms of your success rate. The more you launch, the more winners you find, right? The idea here is that we're trying to launch as many products as we can, product after product after product, until we find the winner. Okay, and I'll play devil's advocate real quick. Quick, If I launch 100 products, right, isn't that gonna cost me thousands of dollars? Definitely, right? Every product's gonna cost you $25 for testing. Okay, and again, there are mi millions of different strategies out there. I'm talking about my strategy. It's gonna cost you $25 to test a product. Okay, let's just do easy numbers. You launch 10 products, that's $250 in ad spend. Let's do 20 products, okay, make it a little bit worse. 20 products, you find one winner. You've now spent 500 bucks on testing, right? 25. Uh, products times uh, $25 per product times 20 products. You're 500 bucks in the hole. Okay, any winning product that you find, anything that you could scale, you're gonna make way more than $500, there's no doubt about it. Right, we're talking about audiences on the small side of 75, 100, 125,000 just on single ad sets. We're talking about niches in the millions, right? Cat niche, for example, 35 million. Okay, if you find a product out of your 20 launches and you spend $500 to do it, you find a scalable product, you're gonna make 10, 50, 100x your initial investment. Right? So never be scared to test products. You want to test products nonstop. Right? Now, here's another uh, way to play devil's advocate to this question. You launch a lot of different products, and you sit there on day five and you say, oh, I'm not so sure. You know? Now it's day 10, not sure. Right? Day 15, okay, I'm gonna cut the ads now. Okay, now you've spent three times the amount that you need to. So the volume game strategy, you're gonna see how this corresponds to everything I teach, is gonna go into the strategy of cutting at $25, okay? And I'll go more into that when we talk about ads. But yes, $5 a day ads, they definitely still work, okay? Anyone who's telling you otherwise is probably trying to just justify what they're teaching in their course. $5 a day absolutely still works. And I know there are multiple people in this room that are having success with $5 a day right now. Or you're one of them, 
Or you have a question? Okay, okay, go for it. Sure. I heard under Monica Barnes mentioned that the higher the budget, for example, $10, there's less tiers of payment. So you're saying that uh, I don't believe that's correct. Now, there are definitely different tiers of audiences, no doubt, right? What the pixel is supposed to do, the Facebook pixel, is supposed to find the best of the best of your audience. Okay, so let's say you have a million person audience. You have a Facebook pixel. You spend $5. Let's say you spend 10 I spend 5 Okay? Facebook's job is to use the pixel to figure out, for, for that budget, either 5 or 10 who are the best people I can get out of that? So, in fact, the best people that you're going to get out of any audience is through your first $5, uh, your first $5 ad. Because think about it. You have 24 hours to spend your $5. Or Facebook has 24 hours, right? You have a pixel that's telling you who the best people are, right? Facebook wants to spend every penny that you offer. Right? Of course, they want to make money. So let's say you're spending $10 throughout 24 hours. I'm spending $5 throughout 24 hours. I'm trying to test the product, right? Which is the hardest part, right? Figuring out if a product works. I, Facebook's going to have to spend my $5 much more carefully than yours. In fact, 50% uh, less or 50% slower than they spend yours, which means the pixel can pick and choose a little bit better. Right? So if I'm only giving $5 to spend throughout the day, Facebook's going to make sure that it finds those best of the best people in the pixel. You'll go after the best of the best as well, but since you have $10 budget, you're going to go after a little bit worse people. Right? So I don't believe that's true at all. I think that on $5 a day, you know, oftentimes on $5 a day, you'll find success. Right? Because you're, really give, you're making Facebook work as hard as possible, saying, you, I, I have 24 hours to spend this $5, Right, I need to spend it as effectively as possible. Facebook would not want us to spend $5 and not get results. Right, they're not just going to blast. That's why they don't spend $5 in a minute. Right, if you have a $5 budget, it gets spread out because they want to find the best of the best of the audience. So I, I don't, maybe, maybe they described it in a different way. I disagree with you know, that statement, though, for sure. Okay, and, and it goes along the lines of $25, right? 5 or 10, 25 or 50. The bottom line is you're going to get enough data. You'll see this in the session. You'll get more than enough data on $25 to understand what's going on. You might not make $10,000 off your first 25 bucks. Probably won't. But you'll have all the data that you need to understand what to do next. So I want you guys to, again, because we're playing the volume game, I want you guys to be as uh, cheap as possible. right? I want you to, to spend as little as possible to find a winner. When you have a winner, great. We're going to scale it. We're going to milk every dollar out of it. But before we do that, we need to be as cheap as possible. I want you guys to spend as little as possible testing as many products as you can. Okay. So again, this is all about just being realistic. right? And I told you everything kind of goes hand in hand. This strategy works so well because we can test products so cheaply because we're never touching them. Right? If I'm selling this t-shirt or a drop ship product, a phone case, whatever, you know, all I have to do is spend money on the print-on-demand side, obviously, getting the design. Otherwise, we're just spending money on the test. So we're talking about only spending $25 per test, no inventory cost, right? no risk, and nothing left over in our warehouse. Go ahead. A quick question on that. One of your, um, in your ad targeting video, you talk about testing a product over video and also straight image. Yep. So that's only 10 bucks per product. Totally. But those things are split, one through four. And I, I don't know if everyone's seen the video. But in the video, there's eight bullet points talking about how to test. Right, how do you test a product? And it's going to be talking about testing multiple interest groups. right? And interest groups we'll go over later today. But the answer to the question is, you would do that if the data tells you to. You don't automatically do it. Right? We don't automatically give every product a second test because the $25 is going to give us enough information. Right? So if we get to the point, and we'll see, we'll see some specific uh, examples. right? We get to a point where we have no sales. We lost money on our $25 ad, but we have other signals that are telling us to do good things, uh, telling us that the product might be demanded. For sure, we would do exactly what you described. Different ad set, we could even try video, we could try a different objective, maybe we try video views, right? But uh, from, the, from the front, right, from the first test, $25 out of pocket, that's it. I want you to read the data and then move on to the next thing. Okay? So, uh, again, you know, we're talking about basically how this strategy is safer, right? Because you're going to spend less money. Okay, we do that 25, uh, 20 product test times $25, only $500 out of pocket. And you're testing, I mean, I think you really only need to test 8 to 12 products in a niche, then you can move on. Okay. So of course, when we find winners, we're going to want to scale it and all that stuff. But again, the focus is really just doing this for as cheap as possible. Okay. Any questions on, on number one? Go ahead. Good question. Uh, is it really realistically just one ad set, one interest targeting group per product, or are you testing more than one ad set for that? Okay. Yeah, good question. I mean, if you're like if your interest target is totally off, but it's a good product, isn't that kind of a gray area? Yeah, that's a great question. That, that, that would be the end. That, that's the question that everyone should ask about my strategy, right? And I think that people ignore the fact of how powerful data is, right? You have, you familiar with the interest group strategy that I teach? And I'm going to go over it today if anyone isn't. 
basically grouping interest into like into similar groups, right? You have these similar groups, right? There's absolutely no chance that the stats will lie in terms of saying, I have a terrible product on this ad, and then using a different interest group, you'll never turn that into a winner. And like magazines and like all Exactly right. So so uh, just to kind of flesh out that example, you're in the cat niche, you have a, a, a cat t-shirt, and we test it with a uh, interest group of or, or our targeting is cat magazines, right? People that like cat magazines. The ad bombs completely, right? No sales. We look at the data. I'm gonna go over the data. We look at the data. We got low click-through rate. Uh, how are you doing? Low CPM or high CPM, no demand for the product, right? The interest group, if you change it, nothing is gonna change, right? You're not gonna go from a complete loser to a complete winner if you've built your targeting inside of the same niche. Because your magazine interest group versus, let's say, a cat food brand interest group it will be different in size, but it will be similar in the fact that obviously it's all under the cat niche. So uh, you're never going to miss a winning product. I promise you that. $25, if you have a winning product, you're going to see it. $25, if you have a losing product, you're going to see that as well, as long as you pay attention to the correct stats. Okay, so it's a great question. It should be the question that everyone asks for my strategy. Were there any other questions on that? No? Cool. All right, number two. Misconception number two, ad versus product, okay? It's a misconception that a specific Facebook ad objective is the reason for your success, okay? How many in here run website conversion ads as their primary ad? Raise, raise your hand. Should be everyone, right? Who doesn't run website conversion ads as their primary ad in here? And I'll go over ad objectives and stuff like that. There's website conversion, there's page post engagement, there's video views, there's clicks to website. Right, website conversion is by far the best ad objective, okay? But the reason that your product sold is not because of your ad. Okay, I'm telling you that right now. It's not because of your ad objective at all. If you give me a great product, I can sell it with any ad type at all. I could do PPE, I could scale to six figures. I could scale to six figures with clicks to website, with video views, with website conversion. It doesn't matter, right? Anytime you have a winning product, and this is actually part of the scaling, it's called scaling by objective, you're gonna wanna scale out to all your different objectives, okay? But my point of this misconception uh, example is that a website conversion ad, it can't turn a bad product into a winner. Okay, it can't fix bad targeting. Okay, it can't, more importantly, it can never force product to customer match. Okay, ad objectives don't do that, right? Product to customer match is simply about your, your selection of product in the niche. Is it intriguing enough to the niche on one side and then your targeting on the other, right? So I want you to stop thinking about, you know, should I start with website conversion? Should I start with PPE? Should I start with clicks to website, right? It doesn't really matter, right? You want to start with website conversion because it's, it's going to give you the best chance to succeed, but that's not the reason why your product is working, right? In other words, it's, it, like I said before, it's the marketing, right? Marketing 101, match your product up with the right customer. If you do that, regardless of what ad type you're going to uh, uh, run, you'll find success. Will you find more success with website conversion versus PPE? Absolutely, you definitely will. There's no doubt website conversion is the best ad type out there. Okay? But if you have a winning product, every ad type will work. Okay? So what does that tell you? Right? What does that tell you about some of the things that you might be spending time on? Right? Focus more, or focus really only, on your marketing 101 concept, matching your product to the right customer. That's all you need to focus on. Okay? Don't get overwhelmed by you know, oh, manual bidding is the new thing, or you know, uh, uh, $25 budgets, or $5 budgets, or whatever. Find the product to customer match first. Right? And in fact, find it as cheap as you can. Doesn't matter what ad, what ad you run. I want you to run website conversion, but I want you to focus, remember, the only thing you care about is finding pro product to customer match. That is by far the most important thing, okay? If your ad isn't working, right? If your ad isn't working, it's almost definitely because of your product to targeting match. It's about your targeting, it's about what you picked. It's not because of the ad objective you, pick, you picked in there, okay? Again, website conversion will definitely give you a better chance to succeed, but it's not the end all be all. It's not the main reason why you're not succeeding, okay? Remember, this is marketing, right? We can't ignore marketing, okay? And I see a lot of people just simply ignoring the fact that you need a good product and you need to match that up with the right customer. Okay, uh, any questions on that? That's a real quick one. Okay, cool. Uh, number three, $5 a day, right? Go ahead. You say with it or qu quickly or with it? With it. Yeah, so I think, you know, I'm not so sure. First of all, all ad sets and object, all campaigns will be separate. So in terms of bringing down the cost, I don't believe that that's a true statement. I think it's, I think it's a big misconception. I think it's something that's got spread in the groups because what we started doing is PPE to basically test the product because we used to get click-through on PPE. We used to get link clicks, right? We don't get that anymore. 
Also to get social proof, right? We want to see a lot of likes, a lot of shares. It's been proven that that doesn't affect your cost on a different ad, right? And we could test that at any time. For example, let's say you go and, and run an ad that you ran two years ago, has thousands and thousands of likes and shares. If you run a website conversion ad, your cost, it won't matter if it's a new ad or an existing ad, totally separate, right? So you're not going to reap the benefits from kind of, like people say, warm up the ad with PPA, right? There's no warming up, right? They're totally separate. Now, if you want to talk about just perception, right? Maybe people look at the ad and say, there's thousands of likes, maybe I can trust this a little bit more. I think there's some value in that, definitely. I don't think there's enough monetary value in that to run a PPE ad. My official recommendation, skip PPE off the bat. I don't want to run PPE, I'm not going to run PPE until I'm scaling. And I told you before, scale by objective, right, PPE. So I think, you know, really, I, th I think it's a big misconception. I think they're, they're, they're totally separate things, and really I think PPE just doesn't work anymore. You don't get the click-through rate. You, you, you can see your stats, and we could all run PPE ads, we'll all get penny engagements, right? And that used to be something cool. We used to be happy about getting penny engagements because it meant our targeting was on. But in the old days, like three, four years ago, we'd also get, you know, $25 of PPE, we might also get like 15 link clicks. Now you spend $25 PPE, you probably won't even get one link click, right? The PPE ads are just completely devalued, and it's no one's fault except, no offense, your own. Not you, but I'm telling anyone who runs PPE. Because Facebook gives you exactly what you ask for. You want a website conversion ad? You want, you want website conversion? You ask for website conversion. You want, you want post engagement? You ask for page post engagement. So um, I'm really, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about the fact that I don't like PPE. I really don't. I, I don't like it. I, I used to run it. I used to love it. I started with it. Um, now I say don't, don't, just don't waste your time on it. I really don't waste your time on it until you get to scaling, and I'll show you that later on today. Okay, that was a good question though. Uh, any other, and you're from Brooklyn, right? Thanks for coming. Uh, any other questions on that one? So that used to work before, running PPE ads? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I'd probably say 2013, 2014, it was, there was no website conversion. There was no pixel. So the only ads, there was uh, your traditional cost per click and your PPE. And uh, PPE worked tremendously well. Um, the, the only metric that you can track for PPE right now, you can go into any of your PPE ads if you have them right now, go to the performance and clicks column in your ads and look at the number of link clicks. That's it. Look at the number of link clicks. And if you don't have like at least, let's say, uh, 15 link clicks on $25, you're done, right? Because you're just not getting any, you're not going to figure out what's going on with PPE until you get link clicks, right? Because everyone's going to like and share and comment. That's cheap, right? Everyone can do that without taking their credit card out. It's actually about getting to the website that we care about. So PPE does, does it's not worth it anymore. Okay? Uh, number three, misconception number three. You can hit five or six figures a day or a month with $5 a day ads, right? That's a misconception, right? And you might, might be saying, well, didn't you just say that $5 a day ads work, uh, they definitely work. They work tremendously well. But, and you see the point over here, it's kind of easy to confuse what's working or what strategies are working when you see people's massive screenshots and stuff like that. You know, everyone has screenshot envy. It's totally normal. What you're not seeing is their total budget, right? And anyone who tells you they're running $5 a day ads making six figures a month, they're lying to you, 100%. The metrics could never, ever, ever work. You could be getting 10 cent uh, cost per click on a website click, you still wouldn't be able to do those numbers at $5 a day, right? $5 a day is simply an entry point for you to get into this business, right? And it's an amazing entry point as well because what business can you go and start testing your product for only $5 a day, right? It's very rare to find that, especially when you're finding that there is no cost. $5 a day, like you see, incredible strategy. It's the best, it's the number one strategy on Facebook. Don't let anyone tell you anything else. It is the number one strategy in terms of running your ads on Facebook, but there's absolutely no way you can get 100,000% ROI on an ad. Right, because that's the ROI you need to make your five, six figures with your $5 ads. Your $5 ads are, again, your entry. They're gonna get you ready to scale. They're gonna allow you to figure out what deserves to be scaled without spending the money to do it. When you're ready to scale, you better be ready to spend money, okay? The last part over here, to me, scaling equals reward, right? You wanna make money, you scale when something is working. You should be looking forward to scaling, okay? And I, I kind of position it this way because I'll tell you that my big breakthrough, you know, I was, doing, I was doing okay. You know, before I started doing huge numbers is before I figured out how to scale, right? And I'll tell you the truth, I was scared of scaling, right? Scaling means more money, right? More money out of pocket means more risk, right? And that actually held me back, right? Thinking about not wanting to put more money at risk because let's say I have a great $5 ad and I think ROI can really screw you up, right? ROI can screw you up and say, my ad is great, I'm getting a 500% ROI, right? And I used to ask this question, right? What would you rather have, 500% ROI or a 10% ROI, right? Everyone says 500? Yeah. I'd take 10%, okay, and I'll tell you why. 
I'd rather spend $20,000 and take 10% ROI on that than get a 500% ROI on my $5 ad. Right? And obviously it was a loaded question, right? I mean, I didn't give you the, the information to answer the question fully, right? And I wanted you to say that. So you, you know, you're gonna make $25 on your example, on the 500% example, I'm gonna make 2,000. Okay, so ROI doesn't, I mean, ROI matters, obviously you need to be profitable, but don't let ROI be the thing that you're gonna post up on your refrigerator and you know, show your mom about it and make her proud about your ROI. No one cares about ROI, right? You often see gurus and mentors talk about ROI when they're trying to boost up their course or their, their stuff, right? That's, that's the bottom line, right? ROI is a totally relative number, okay? So when you get to scaling, right, when you get to this point where you move off of your $5 ads, right, you would never want to be running at $5 ads because you'd need a ridiculous ROI, which is just simply not realistic, okay? Going back to my example, let's say, you know, there was a day I ran 25,000 in one day on ads. My margin was like, I mean, my, my, uh, yeah, my net was like 18%. Right, horrible ROI, right? You don't see anyone posting screenshots about 18% ROI, but if you do the math on that day, I must have made like four or $5,000 net, and no one cares, right? That four or $5,000 profit is still profit. It doesn't matter what ROI I got on it. And in fact, me getting that 18% uh, that ROI was easier than you getting a 500% ROI, right? right? It's just easy numbers. What, what would you rather go after, an 18% ROI or a 500% ROI? One's very realistic and one isn't. Okay, so remember that scaling is your reward. It also makes your life easier in the fact that you don't need to have these massive, um, uh, you know, these massive uh, ROI campaigns, okay? Talking about leveraging risk, right? Upside still being huge. Let's take a look at $5 a day versus $25 a day, okay? We're talking about on five days, right? Through five days, you either spend 25 total or you spend 75 total, okay? And you spending 75, you would get three times the amount of data that I would get, okay? I would spend $50 less than you. And effectively, I could test three products for the same cost that you would test one. So the question is, that $50 extra spend, is that data valuable? I'll tell you right now, it's not, right? Your data between $15, $20, $25 is very, very, very relevant, very valuable. Your data between $25 and $75 should look exactly the same. So why spend more to get the same data, right? We want to just test more products. Again, playing right into the volume game strategy. Okay, any questions on that? This is a straightforward one. Okay, uh, number four, product success. Okay, misconception that every product you launch is gonna be a success. Right, anybody have any, any uh, sense of like what product success rates you guys have? Any, any idea? 15, that's good. Uh, no, really small is normal, right? You know, 5% you can make a lot of money on. 15% is great, right? 15% is great and I would say you could make a lot more money if you apply scaling to those as well. Right, 15%, I, I, don't, I don't do 15%, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I would love to shoot 10% on a niche, you know, one out of every 10. Okay, and again, that plays into the volume game where you won't make money, right? You will not make money at a five or 10 or 15% success rate if you're sticking at your $5 uh, a day ads, right? If you don't know how to launch. But I kind of went over this example earlier, right? 20 launches times 25 bucks only puts you $500 in the hole. And you're gonna make a lot more money that on a fully scaled product. Okay, so it's totally okay to launch product and fail. Don't worry about that, okay? You want me to go back to that slide? And, you don't need to, I'm gonna send you guys this recording and all the slides, but you know, feel free to do it. Uh, you don't need to hit 100% product success. You don't need to feel bad about yourself when you launch a week's worth of products and they all fail. Okay, and I think that's a big thing mindset wise. Don't beat yourself up when you launch 20 products and you don't find a winner. Everyone's doing that every single day. They're just not promoting the fact that they do it. Right, everyone is doing that, I promise you that, okay? So when you combine the volume game strategy with scaling, with the cutting at $25, this is the strategy that I'll go over in a little bit, you basically have the idea, or you basically have a setup where failure is totally okay, right? And when you think about it, you'd rather clearly fail than even potentially have a, a gray area of success. What do I mean by that? I'd rather go on my first $25 to spend, I'd rather know for sure that the product just sucks. Easy way to lose money, is when you stop testing products at $25, right? You go $25 and you're not sure, okay? If you're not sure, that's okay. You could be not sure one time, okay? You can give a product a second test, okay? But what's really dangerous is saying, I don't know if this product is a winner or not, I'm gonna give it more tries. Because now you're 50, 75, 100, $150 in the hole on a product that you're not sure about yet. Your $25 spent, you wanna throw that product away. If you're not profitable, it's gone, okay? There are some key stats that might make you test the product a second time, but overall, you're out of there, okay? And you wanna be out of there as quickly as possible because products that deserve your money are only products that are making you money, okay? 
So you don't want to just test products for the sake of testing them. You want to test products to find the winners, and you want to drop out at $25 as quickly as you can. Okay, and I say develop the skill. This is a big skill, right? It's a big skill in terms of one concept, understanding the concept, and two, you know, uh, being sound enough of mind to say, I'm going to toss away this product. I think a lot of people get attached to products. I talk to a lot of people about this. They don't want to d ditch a product. They think the t-shirt design is really cool. Or they, they did research, right? They did research on, on, uh, on ShopSpy and it says top selling product. Or they did T-Spy research and it says 50,000 t-shirts sold, right? Or they do, you know, any, any type of those tools out there that, that tell you how many sold. Or you look on AliExpress and it says 48 million pieces sold, whatever, right? And then you run your ad, you run $25 and it doesn't work. And you say, well, you know, my mom says this design is great. Or, you know, I, I, got, I got 20 comments that say I need this, right? I'm sure, I'm sure all of you in this room get comments, right? It says, I need this, I, I want this. And then you want to reply and be like, okay, then buy it. Like, here's the link, you know? But it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen and that's normal, okay? You need to go off and ditch the product. And that's a, a skill to develop, right? You want to be robotic in this business, right? I talk about scaling robotically, scaling emotionlessly. You want to cut your products without emotion. Okay, the only product that I love is a product that has made me money. Right? That's the only product that I get attached to. I don't care about any other product. So your $25 mark, you get there, you're not profitable, you're turning off that ad, you're not feeling bad about it, and you're moving on to the next one. Okay? Super important. Any questions on that? No? Okay, this is a good one. Misconception number five, ad metrics. Okay? And I'm gonna go over the metrics that are important, so this is why you see it's a, a misconception. Uh, how many of you guys have heard of the relevance score on Facebook? Yeah, most of you guys. Just real, real briefly, it's a metric that you'd see in your ad report. Basically tells you about the health of your ad. Okay? It, they're, they're, they're very general about like, Facebook doesn't exactly tell you what goes into it, probably on purpose. Okay? It's a misconception that relevance score measures the success of your ad. Okay? I'll, give you a, I'll give you another loaded scenario here. Okay? You got two ads. One has a relevance score of 10. The other has a relevance score of one. What ad would you rather have? Right? right. No, no. I, it's another trick question. You don't, you don't, you don't know. I, I would take a relevance score of one if I was profitable on the ad. Relevance score is absolutely meaningless if you don't have a profitable ad. Why would you care if you have a 10 relevance score if no one's buying your product? Right? Your job as a Facebook marketer is not to get good ad metrics. Your job is to make money, right? Relevance score is not important. Go ahead. What, what are they measuring to give you that score? They don't tell us, but what we believe the numbers to be is a combination of, first of all, they definitely tell us that it has to do with positive and negative feedback on your ad, okay? Now, negative feedback is quantifiable in terms of negative comments, right? Even some of the reactions, like the sad and the uh, uh, angry reaction, right? Positive comments, obviously likes and comments that are, are not negative, also click-through rate, which deals with positive comments. So this is where they don't, they, kind of, they don't tell you exactly what goes into the positive side, okay? What we believe is positive negative comments, CPM, which is your cost per 1,000 impressions, your CTR, right, and your engagement, right? Engagement, we're, I, we have no idea how they record that, right? Obviously, the lower the CPM, the healthier your ad is. The higher your CTR, the healthier your ad is in terms of demand. So that's what we believe those numbers to be. And, and it's a great question because, really, what does relevance score or any data do? It just helps you understand what to do next. It doesn't tell you what you've already done. There's only one thing to tell you how you've done with an ad, and that's your profit. Right? You have a 10 relevance score and a zero profit, your ad sucks. That's the bottom line. You have a one relevance score and $50 profit, your ad's great. Right? Because your job, you don't care about metrics, you care about money. Right? So relevance score, totally misleading. Okay? Like I see, uh, show you down here. There's only one important stat to measure, and that's profit. Okay. Only one important stat to measure, and let me, let me say, to measure upfront, because there are other stats that we'll talk about. But when you're measuring upfront stats, profit is, that's it. Okay. And this also goes the same for uh, CPM, CTR, CTC, uh, CPC, right? They're all confusing, they could be misleading, whatever. They don't dictate a successful ad. Okay, uh, we'll talk about a little case study. Okay, this was a post in my, uh, in my group a couple days ago, or a couple weeks ago now. So uh, he has a relevant score of four. And he spent $7, and he made $87 in sales. Who cares about the relevance score, right? W would you take this setup? Would you trade your 10 relevance score in for an ad like this? Of course, James is nodding his head yes. Who wouldn't, right? $87 in sales off $7 in spend. What does the relevance score matter here, right? It doesn't matter at all. It does not matter at all. Facebook doesn't know, based on an algorithm, if your ad is successful or not, it's about profit. 
Okay, it's simply about profit. So over here, he's you know got a relevance score, or whatever. I think we've you know everyone in the group kind of went on there and told him you know who cares, right? You're making money. That's all you need to care about. Now, obviously, there are some things that you can pull out of that, right? I'm not going to say, you know, and this is kind of that question before about the interest groups. Like, if I test one, uh, will the other one uh, will the other one work, or you know, will I basically know if I'm testing the, the one correctly or not. You definitely want to look at, at information from this, right? What does relevant score uh, use? It uses negative comments as one thing. So I would definitely be going into that ad and taking a look at why I'm getting negative comments if I, if I am, right? And if you're getting negative comments, right? I think a big thing for negative comments is delete them, right? I always give the example or the anecdote of a billboard. You're driving on the highway. You see a billboard on the side of a company you don't like. Are you allowed to pull over and spray paint your comments on the billboard? Obviously not. Right? So people, you shouldn't allow people to give their negative comments on your ad as well. Delete and ban them immediately. Right? I'm not saying don't give customer service, but I'm definitely saying customer service, there's a place and a time for it, not in your ad. Okay? So get them off there immediately. It's going to hurt your cost. Okay? And I'll get your question in a second. Uh, Facebook says it themselves. This is what Facebook does say about relevance mm -hmm. score. They literally say it should not be used as the primary indicator of an ad because they know. They, they, they know that they're not smart enough to know what a successful ad is. Right? Everyone has different goals. Our goal is obviously to make money. Right, but the relevance score alone is not enough. And there are two levels of decision making that I'm going to go over. First level decision making is simply about profit. Relevance score does not play into that uh, at all. Right? It can play into your second level, what to do next. Right? But it's not going to at all talk about your profitability or if the ad should be continued or not. Okay? Ad metrics overall, I'm going to say this a lot when we talk about reporting, they're simply indications of potential success. Right? They are not success on its own. Okay, I think we got one more uh, misconception. Okay, uh, it's a misconception that you could. Whoops, I think I might have turned that off. It's a misconception that you can succeed in a niche without developing a deep understanding in it. Okay, now niches are super important. Okay, and I, I call this living inside the niche. And right? if you've been inside my boot camp, you, you've heard me say this. I gotta put this down. I keep touching it. I gotta touch something else instead. Okay, living inside the niche, right? This is to say that when you want, oh man, thank you. When you wanna, thank you. When you pick a niche, when you pick a niche, there's only three things to look at. Number one, passion, right? You're picking a niche where people are passionate about it. Number two, you're picking based on size, right? You're not gonna pick a niche that only has 12,000 people in it, there's no upside. So you want to have at least 500,000, ideally over a million. Okay, number three, this is not required, but this is going to make this a lot easier. Number three is having a personal interest in the niche. Right, you all know I have my first big store, cat store. I'm a huge cat guy. I have two cats at home. I'm going to rush home to, get, to hang out with them later tonight. I picked that niche because I know everything about the cat niche. I, I'm in the cat niche myself. I know what resonates. I know what's intriguing. And one of the next sessions is going to be about product intrigue. To understand what's intriguing, you need to have a deep understanding of the niche. Okay, so if you don't have a, uh, if you're not into it yourself, if you don't have an interest in it yourself, you need to live inside the niche. What does that mean? Oh, well, you can do it easily on social, right? You basically pretend that you're like a hardcore cat lover or a hardcore tennis lover or a hardcore scrapbooker, whatever the niche is. And you're going on every single social media site, all the blogs, all the websites, stores, you're reading articles, you're following Instagram accounts, you're following Twitter accounts, etc., until you really kind of live inside the niche. You eat, sleep, breathe the niche. Because you need to be able to do that to be able to go ahead and actually walk the walk, talk the talk, otherwise known as marketing, right? Finding the products that people are going to actually get excited enough to take their credit card out of their wallet. So you cannot just say, hey, uh, John over there made $100,000 selling dog items. I'm going to do dogs, right? That's not enough. You don't have the niche expertise to understand what is going to really resonate with these people, right? You see John did $100,000 in the dog niche. You have dogs at home. You've been buying dog products for years. You love dogs. Perfect. That's an ideal scenario, right? But if you're jumping into the niche just because John or Mary made $100,000 in it, you're setting yourself up for failure. Or you're going to have to do a lot of this, right? A lot of living inside your niche, okay? Living inside the niche, not a one-day exercise, right? This is why I have an advantage over you if you were to launch a cat store, unless you're a, you know, a, a crazy cat guy. I have an advantage over you because I know everything about the niche already, right? And you don't need to immediately become an expert. It's impossible to become an expert overnight. But if you immerse yourself hours three, four, five hours a day on social, right? and you're, everyone's on their phone 10 hours a day anyway, just start following those accounts, liking all those pages, you'll start to immerse yourself in that world of that niche. 
right? And that's how you live inside the niche. That's how you understand what's going to work. And when you do that, right, what is this going to really happen? Or, or, or what is going to benefit you by doing this? Well, that 1 in 20 product launch number is going to start coming down. 1 in 15, 1 in 12, 1 in 10, because um, you have a better understanding of what intrigues people. How do you 